Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? The Bible is God's book, and therefore we are pleased as anything can be that we can use that wonderful book that God has given us, the Bible, uh, that we can use it as our authority, as our guidebook. My, mind, the Bible is the superlative book of all books, the king of all books. And it's a book that I cannot recommend it too highly. It's not possible because, you see, it is a book that God himself has written. It's an impossible idea that Almighty God, who created this lovely universe, that he also has given us a written document that can be put into the covers of one book and we can hold in one hand. And that is a record of God's laws for the human race. Those laws are given not to cut us down, not to not to uh, for our detriment but they are given for our good the problem is of course we don't want to obey those laws and that's what gets us into trouble as a matter of fact the bible tells us what kind of trouble we get into and it's a pretty terrible trouble but also the bible has that marvelous message of salvation that tells us how we can get out of our troubles the bible is God's book. It is the book that every human ought to be intensely acquainted with. If you spend time reading a lot of other books, just think, that's not where you're finding real truth. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read the Bible. Read it slowly, carefully, and, and ask the Lord that you might have, uh, have some understanding and that you might want to be obedient to it. This is that wonderful message, the message of the Bible that Family Radio is all about as it sends it into the whole wide world. And isn't it wonderful that you and I can uh, provide our time and our energy and our money in order to s send the Bible out into the world so extensively, so intensively. This is the greatest good that we can desire for anybody in the human race. In our love for our fellow man, we want the highest good for them, and that is that they might have access to a Bible and might realize, might be encouraged to read that Bible. It's no good to have a Bible on a shelf. It's a, Bi a Bible is to be read. It is to be pondered. It is to be meditated upon. And if, then the Bible can be uh, uh, fruitful in our lives. Well, before we take our first call on our telephone lines, uh, we have a question here that comes again from China. We get quite a bit of mail from China. And uh, it's a curious uh, question or, or a curious verse in actuality. Uh, in Ecclesiastes, we read in chapter 7, verse 16, and let me read it. It says there, Be not righteous over much, neither make thyself over wise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? What a curious verse. We would really think as we, as we read that, that this is a contradiction. Because isn't that the desire of every human, that we might become completely righteous, that we might uh, uh, be so righteous that we might not have to pay for any of our sins? Well, therein lies the problem. There are those who attempt to become as righteous as possible. Uh, as good as possible, thinking that in so doing, they are going to achieve eternal life. They are going to become acceptable to God. But the Bible says that Christ did not come for the righteous, but for sinners. You see, however righteous we try to be, if we 
have not found someone to pay for our sins, we're still in deep trouble with God. So we have to recognize that we're sinners and that we're never going to get to heaven by our own self-righteousness. Oh, yes, it is an intense desire uh, uh, of the one who has become a true believer that he is perfectly righteous before God. But he recognizes that his righteousness is not based on what he is doing that is so good or that is so righteous, but rather that it is based on the fact that whatever sin comes in his life, uh, past, present, or future, it has been covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus. The guilt has been taken by him. And, uh, and as a consequence of ha- salvation, and this will uh, happen if, if Christ has saved us, we will have that realization that Christ has paid for our sins. Uh, the consequence is that we'll have an intense desire to be righteous, to do the will of God, but not f- for the reason of trying to, to get into heaven, but for the reason that we're happiest when we do this. And, and it's the way we live thankful lives before God. Uh, and this will be the, an, an important aspect of our new nature. The Bible says that which is born of God cannot sin. Well, thank you, China, for that uh, question. And now shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hi, Mr. Camping? Yes. Um, My husband and I have a question about Isaiah 28. Isaiah 28, okay. Let's yeah, look at that. Nine, what, what verse is it? Uh, 9 to 13, where God speaks about um, speaking to us line upon line, precepts yes. upon. The first time he mentions it, it sounds like it's, it's for good. The second time, it sounds like we would be snared. Yes, I well. Don't understand. We don't understand that. All right, let's read this. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon a precept, line upon line, line upon line, here uh, uh, a little and there a little. Now, so far, what God is teaching is, is that as we learn from the Word of God, we, uh, we have to look at every word, every line, everything is important. We just can't kind of generalize and say, well, this chapter kind of says thus and so, but every verse stands very, very carefully. But there is a problem, and, there, and God here is, is warning Israel of their day, this uh, the prophet Isaiah is speaking, but he is also warning uh, uh, the churches of our day. He says, "For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Uh, you see, back in Deuteronomy 28, we, we, this, the, an understanding of this passage <coughs> really goes, begins uh, earlier. And in Deuteronomy 28, God warned Israel before they ever came into the land of Canaan. He warned them that, uh, that when they came into the land of Canaan and became a big nation, that God would, or that they would rebel against God and that uh, there would be terrible things that were happening. And so God warned in verse 49 of Deuteronomy 28, The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. And he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy land until thou be destroyed. 
In other words, you are, Israel, you are going to start running after other gods and uh, and uh, uh, you are going to be uh, looking to nations whose language you do not understand and uh, hankering after their their uh, altars and their uh, fine horses and fine clothing and so on and they are going to bring judgment against you they are going to come against you they're a nation whose language you do not understand now this was literally carried out in the days of Isaiah as Israel ran after the Assyrians they wanted to be like the Assyrians they who which of course were were uh, uh, foreign altogether to the Bible to the law of God and it was the very Assyrians that finally destroyed them incidentally later on in Jeremiah 5 we find the same kind of an indictment coming against Judah, they ran after the Babylonians, wanting to uh, follow their gods and and so on. And it was the Babylonians who came as a nation whose language they did not understand and destroyed them. And this is furthermore anticipating our day, as as God makes reference to this in First Corinthians 14, where people have. Uh, have had a tremendous desire to speak in tongues and, and that is follow gospels that that believe that God is still speaking today they're false gospels because God uh, has completed his message and he does not come with dreams or visions or in a tongue but that's what they want and and so they get tied into these kind of gospels and they are destroyed by these gospels because they're following a gospel that has nothing to do with salvation. Now, this is what Isaiah 28 is anticipating. For with stammering lips and another tongue will we speak to this people. That is, they are not ready to take the Bible line upon line and precept upon precept as it stands and, and, and carefully follow what the salvation program of the Bible is they want their own kind of a gospel, and so God will speak to them through a nation like the Assyrians or like the Babylonians or the tongues people of our day. And, and, uh, uh, and when we get down to verse 13, the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. That is, the word of God came true precisely uh, as it is, as it develops, and the, the nature or the, uh, the uh, product of the word of God is that the judgment came upon Israel, came upon Judah, is coming upon the churches and congregations of our day exactly as the Bible, line upon line, word by word, uh, uh, precept by precept, law by law, had decreed it would happen. But we, as, we as believers and even non-believers should take the Bible word upon word, line upon line, precept upon precept in order to learn, right? Yeah, that's where we have to learn it. You see, the Bible is a very precise book. And when we're coming to truth, we can never run roughshod, roughshod over a verse. We have to look at it very carefully, word by word. And, we, and before we can claim we have any understanding, we have to check uh, what we think that verse is teaching against everything else the Bible might teach that relates to it. And that's a lot of hard work. It's, it requires very careful study. But until we have done our homework with the whole Bible, we can't really know whether our conclusions are correct or not. That's right. Well, I thank you for your time. And, you know, we've been listening to family radio, my husband and I, since 1986. Well, and we became Christians, th believers, through your station, listening to your station, when you first started Revelation. 
Well, you know, it's not, it's you became believers because you were listening to the word of God, and God, in His mercy, applied that word to your hearts. It is God who did the whole thing. We family radio is just a vehicle to get the gospel out into the world, and and our expectation is that that. Uh, there will be many who are saved because we read, for example, right now, when things are so bad in the churches, outside there's a great multitude which no man can number that are being saved. And that's why we're so delighted, so delighted that we can have a little part in that as we band together in a ministry like Family Radio to get that gospel into all the world. And we feel very blessed to be a part of... Uh, uh uh, a little bit of that. I, I, we, we love you and Family Radio, and especially the Lord God very much, and we thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Good evening, Mr. Camping. Uh, could you tell me about Genesis four seven? Genesis chapter four, verse. Seven, uh, and uh, the, the Lord is speaking to Cain. Cain is uh, the first son that was born to Adam and Eve, and he has uh, he has uh, uh, offered an, a sacrifice to God, a, me, a meal offering, whereas his brother, younger brother Abel, had offered a lamb, and God ex- accepted. Abel's offering, but not Cain's offering, and so Cain is very angry, and uh, and uh, uh, and the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou angry or wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt not uh, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. Now, what is your question? Unto who shall be his desire, and who shall he rule over? What's that that last part of the verse? Unto thee shall be his desire. Who is his? Well, let's look at it and see if we can uh, uh, understand. If thou doest well, that is, if you Cain, if you do well... Shalt thou not be accepted? Well, accepted by who? By God. By God. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. That is, if you are, if you are uh, rebellious, or and if you are, if your uh, thinking is all wrong, it's because you are in sin. You are living in sin. And unto thee shall be his desire and here god i think is per, is personifying sin the uh, the uh, the uh, sin desires to have a sin uh, uh, and satan uh, uh, they they are, are they go very closely together they desire to have us and yet we should rule over sin we should not let it rule over us i think we have to understand this verse that way. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Campy. One other question, Mr. Campy. Uh, Isaiah 33, 21. Isaiah 33, 21. There we read Isaiah 33, 21. We read, uh, but there the... Let's, let's begin... Let's see, we want to be pick up the context here. Uh, let's start with verse 20. Look unto Zion, the city of our solemnities. Thine eyes shall see Jerusalem, a quiet habitation, a tabernacle that shall not be taken down. Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. But there the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams, wherein shall go no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ships pass thereby. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king, he will save us. Is that the is that the verse? The glorious the question Lord. Is, the question is the galleys and the oars and the ships. 
Yes. Well, that, you see, this this Zion, because it speaks of it. Now, bear in mind when God talks about Zion or Jerusalem, uh, they are synonyms. Definitely synonyms. God can be talking about Zion or Jerusalem in its external uh, corporate representation as it existed in the Old Testament as, uh, as the nation of Judah or the nation of Israel or as it exists in the New Testament as the churches and congregations. They are Zion or Jerusalem from an external vantage point representing the kingdom of God externally. But Zion or Jerusalem can also be understood as the eternal Jerusalem or Zion that every true believer automatically enters into when he has become saved. And we must always determine from the context which Zion is, uh, the, 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 uh, is in view. Uh, the... Uh, throughout the nation of the time of the nation of Israel as well as throughout the church age uh, there were those who were in the eternal Zion that also uh, 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 they were also in the uh, in the external uh, uh, physical Zion or Jerusalem uh, but on the other hand, there were a great many people in the nation of Israel and in, throughout the church age and the churches who were physically in that external representation of the kingdom of God called Zion or Jerusalem, but in actuality were not saved at all and were not a part of the eternal Zion or the eternal Jerusalem. Now, in this case, God is talking about the eternal Zion or Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, if you will. That is, it, all those who uh, have become citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We know that because in verse 20 it says, Not one of the stakes thereof shall ever be removed, neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. Uh, that is, this is an eternal Zion. And now when he talks about the, the no galley with oars, neither shall gallant ships pass thereby, uh, that God is talking about enemies coming in. These are figures, I believe, I, I, I haven't looked at these phrases for a long time, but I think if I recall, these are figures that have to do with an enemy trying to destroy. Now the enemy can destroy the corporate external Zion or Jerusalem. Uh, they can come in with, uh, with uh, false doctrines and even Satan can rule there as he is right now uh, during the uh, great tribulation time. But into the eternal Zion that whose stakes will never be removed, the enemy can never come. We are safe and secure eternally. We can never, never lose our salvation, is really what this is teaching. Thank you, Mr. Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Hello. Hello. Brother Camping. Yes, good I'm evening. I'm looking at uh, uh, Ecclesiastes uh, 7, 17. Ecclesiastes. 717. Let's look at that. Ecclesiastes 717. Be not overmuch wicked, neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? Yes. I, I'm not sure I know the meaning of this. I do know this. Uh, uh, in the Bible, when God uses the word foolish, he is speaking about those who are continually wicked, that is, who never do become saved. And, uh, and uh, now what he means by that you shall die before thy time, I really don't know the meaning of that. I, I have never worked on that phrase, so I can't help you with that. That is what I was calling you about. Yes. I was... Yes. 
I was wondering where the, you don't know anything about it, but I was wondering if you can die before your time, meaning that, uh, you know, you can rush yourself, you know. You're yeah. pointing to wants to die and then the judgment, right? Yeah. Well, well we, there are people who can rush their times in different situations. People can drink their self early death. People can do a lot of different things for early death. You can rush yourself. Well, you the, you, you, we do know this, at least we know this, that wickedness brings destruction. That's the nature of wickedness. We do know that it is pointed unto men that, uh, that, uh, that God's uh, timetable is the... Uh, your time expectancy will be 70 years or if by reason of strength 80 years now someone who is living in, in a very wicked situation where and wickedness uh, invariably brings destruction that's a given and therefore if you are overly wicked if you are uh, if that is growing in your life the likelihood of never getting to the age of 70 or 80 is very strong and of course we see this all the time as people in the drug culture and uh, people who are, are, are living adulterously they die very frequently much much younger uh, or if they're uh, living care very carelessly in their wickedness they can die much younger and that may be at least one understanding although uh, although these are parables and I'm sure there's a deeper spiritual meaning to this that I just don't I'm not aware of at this moment okay but is there can you can you rush yourself like if you're drinking smoking but I'm saying can you rush would you think you can rush yourself if you're smoking drinking that's what well, I'm saying, right? well yes you are inviting destruction sin will bring destruction that is the nature of sin that's the nature of Satan the more we live in a way that's pleasing to the devil uh, he is the very essence of destruction uh, and and on the other hand if we live lives as children of God and we're resting in the Lord and and uh, we are are uh, living as peaceful as possible uh, they, these are all things that will tend to pr prolong our life but of course the important thing is is that we have eternal life and we're we will live with Christ forevermore but I, I really uh, I'm not qualified to dig deeper into this verse uh, because I'll be I will be speculating we're continuing with the open forum program and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum hello yes I'd like to uh, have you explain Luke 16:18 in the uh, in clearly please Luke 16 verse a while back. Luke 16 verse 18 Yes Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery Now this by this verse is very plainly saying that that uh, to marry someone who has been divorced is an act of adultery it becomes an adulterous marriage whosoever put away his wife that is he's divorced someone and now he marries another he commits adultery and and the one that has been put away uh, uh, that is has been divorced if someone marries her or him that uh, that, uh, that then that also is an act of adultery you see God has established very careful rules for the preservation of society uh, the foundation of which is the family so he's established very careful rules for the protection of the husband of the wife and of the children that is that when two people are married, they cannot divorce. They cannot divorce, and and uh, uh, the fact is that uh, that only death can break up that marriage. Only death. But uh, mankind is never, never to contemplate divorce. Of course, we're living in a day of intense rebellion against the Word of God. 
So here in our land, for example, I don't know how it goes in other nations, but here in our land, uh, in America, where we presume that we're so enlightened and what have you, uh, about half of the marriages end up in divorce. The marriage institution has been fatally shattered. I, I just uh, want to thank you. I, I'm very concerned because a lot of churches, the pastors are teaching uh, Deuteronomy 24, and they're, they're saying in uh, Matthew somewhere that there is an exception clause, and I don't believe... I think the watered down versions are saying that. I don't I don't believe that well, they're going by what God is really saying. If God is a God they love Well the problem how can they is say divorce is all right. Yeah, you see the problem is all we're seeing here is an indicator of the apostasy, the falling away that has occurred in the churches and congregations. If you could go back forty years, I don't know if you're old enough to do that, but I can very readily. Forty years ago, in uh, in most churches, you never found a divorced person. Divorce was not not even thought about. We knew that the Bible teaches there is not to be divorce. Now, today, every church and that I'm aware of, every denomination, has concluded that. Oh, but now we understand. The Bible does permit divorce for fornication. But uh, uh, the Bible does not because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, the wife is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And that law has not been set aside. And so uh, it's just an indicator of the rebellion that's going on in the churches. This is just one of many laws of the Bible that the church no longer wants to obey. Oh, I, I confronted my pastor with this, and he kind of shied away from it. Yes. And I really feel very uneasy to go there any longer. Well, I don't know where to go. Well, the fact is, if we if we uh, listen to the, everything that the Bible teaches, we know that the time has come when the true believers have to leave their churches. We're com the churches have become Babylon. That is, Satan now is ruling there, and he is typified by the king of Babylon. And so God says in Revelation 18, verse 4, Come out of her, my people, lest you be caught in your sins. Now, where are we going to go? We, uh, we, God has given us this, the first day Sabbath, the Sunday Sabbath, which has nothing to do with the seventh day Sabbath. It's an entirely different day, but it is a day where God says that we are to do His will. God says that is my holy day. And so it is a day where we are to assemble ourselves together. Now, ourselves, we're not to assemble as a con congregation necessarily at all, but as ourselves and fellowship together. And we can fellowship with, with uh, the Bible. That's the, that, of course, is everything. Uh, we can have the whole day before us to read and ponder the Bible and to pray. It's a day that we can share the gospel with others. We can pass out tracts. We can visit a a nursing home or a prison or we can uh, we can uh, write letters to to friends to encourage them in the word it's, and we uh, may find another individual or two that think as we do and so we can fellowship together and uh, and we can sing together and and it's just a day when we have the whole day just to engage in spiritual activity and that's uh, because uh, from now on in, God is not using an institution like he did in the Old Testament. He used the nation of Israel as a divine institution to be the custodian of the Word of God. Uh, and in the New Testament era, uh, until very recently, he used the churches and congregations as a divine institution to be the custodian of the Word of God, to share it with the world. Now he is using individuals, individuals. We can combine together to collect, to, so that collectively we can do something 
that we can't do as individuals in a ministry like Family Radio, but we still are just individuals. We don't have a membership. We don't have any spiritual rule over anyone. And uh, this is the way God is working today, through individuals. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a huge change. And uh, a lot of people don't understand it any more than when God sh shifted from the synagogues and the temple in Jesus' day to the New Testament church age. The Pharisees and the priests didn't understand that at all. In fact, many became intensely angry about that, but that was God's plan. And God has also given plenty of evidence that he shifted again, that now we are to continue as individuals, not as, a, as an institution of some kind. If we can look for another church that teaches uh, these truths, wouldn't well, that be uh, good? Well, no. See, the fact is that God is finished with the church age. Even if you could find a church that seems still reasonably true, and there might be a few around, although uh, if you start going from church to church, you're going to be appalled at what you find there because most churches have have degenerated very very greatly but even if you could find one it, uh, it we God has, has said we're not to be a part of it God is finished with using the churches to bring the gospel to the world and he's not saving people any longer in the churches the Holy Spirit is not operating there the Bible tells us that he has departed from there and so you don't want to be there uh, but he is saving outside of the church. As a, we read in Romans, Revelation 7, verse 9, I saw a great multitude which no man can number, and they were robed with white robes, that is, they had become saved. And then when the question was raised, where did they come from? The answer comes in verse 13 or 14 of Revelation 7. They came out of great tribulation. And this is the period we're living in, the great tribulation that comes just before the end of the world, which is coming very close to us right now. So if, if, we, if uh, my husband and I uh, uh, both saved, the Lord put on our heart and we cried out to him and uh, opened our heart and our eyes to see the truth. And uh, if we were just wondering, if, if we come across people that are divorced and remarried, I mean, uh, does that mean they're living in sin? Because well, that's how does that differ differentiate? Yes, I see your problem. The, the, the problem is that God recognizes a second marriage, even though it is, has begun as an adulterous marriage. God still recognizes it as a marriage. And, and you can't divorce, either from a second or a third or a fourth marriage, even though it's a wrong marriage. So what do you do? If you have become a child of God, all the sin that is connected with that second marriage is covered by the blood of Christ because all of our sins have been paid for. And so that individual, those individuals are to continue in their second or third marriage, whatever it might be, as if it were a first marriage and never, never contemplate divorce again. Uh, uh, that's the wonder of God's love, the wonder of God's forgiveness that he does does forgive but that doesn't uh, excuse in any sense that second marriage it, it was a very wicked act and there are those you know who have the naive idea well I know that uh, God will forgive me if I marry a second time and so I'll marry and then I'll seek forgiveness and then everything is hunky-dory everything is fine well how do they know God is going to forgive them the only ones that that God forgives are those who have become saved and uh, we don't tell God to save us God ha has to save us and if we deliberately are going to uh, divorce and, and remarry again thinking uh, well I can just get forgiveness uh, it's, a, it's an appalling uh, challenge that we're taking that we're taking on Almighty God himself I would never want to be part of that kind of an action Husband and I, we, we thought, uh, you know, your marriage is till death do you part. And we, we thought if you remarry, that's like 
You're having two wives in God's eyes, isn't it? In God's eyes it is, but you see, in the Old Testament, there were individuals who were true believers uh, uh, who had more than one wife. Now, not everybody did, of course, but King David, for example, had more than one wife, and yet he was beloved of God. This got him into a lot of trouble, plenty of trouble, but nevertheless, uh, he did have, he still was beloved of God. Solomon, his son, had more than one wife, and that got him into a lot of trouble. And yet the Bible is very clear that Solomon was a child of God. But, uh, but uh, apparently the laws concerning second marriages were not, uh, in those days, uh, the Bible was, was uh, not complete, number one. Number two, uh, it, uh, many times there were hardly any copies around. There were times when uh, there was no copy available in the whole nation. Uh, and that's how, how uh, uh, far away they were from the Word of God. But in our day, we have Bibles all over the place, so we can never excuse ourselves and say, well, we didn't know. But isn't it still two, uh, two spouses if you remarry, even though you're saved? Uh... Well, yes, it's uh, in God's sight you have, but you can only live with one. And since you are, it's a second marriage, you have to live with that spouse. And uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, is the, uh, it's, the, it's the only answer in order to try to fit all the laws that God has laid down into the picture. Uh, the, uh, because that's, you cannot divorce from that second marriage. Uh, legally, in the eyes of the land, you have divorced from the first person, but you can't divorce from the second, and you can't, uh, uh, and you can't uh, marry uh, if your spouse dies, your second spouse, you cannot go back and marry your first spouse again. Uh, the Bible warns that that can't be done. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camden. How are you doing tonight? Very well, thank you. All right, Brother Camden, I have uh, a couple questions. Um, <clears throat> first, have you heard of the prime evil chaos theory? A, a prime evil chaos Yes. Uh, well, I don't know. Is that is that where they think that there was a world that was created and populated by angels, and then it got destroyed, and then God recreated it? Um, well, I was asking you because I I've been studying and several study Bibles, King James versions that I've been reading upon have been stating that in Genesis one, between verse one and two of Genesis one that there, I believe Ezekiel 28, they say, covers the chaos theory or stands up yeah. for the chaos theory, yeah, but I, I don't understand it much. Well, the fact is it is not taught in the Bible. It's an, it's an absolutely incorrect understanding of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Genesis 1 is simply a heading uh, that is going to describe what's going to be talked about in that chapter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then, beginning with Genesis 1, verse 2, God describes that creation. Now, uh, the reason that that particular wrong understanding developed was, was trying to explain the fossils in the rocks. And uh, long ago, theologians got the idea, well, Maybe that's the evidence of an earlier creation, and uh, and uh, that became uh, totally uh, 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 destroyed, and then God recreated, and and that's why we still have the fossils in the rocks. Now they they were a long, long ways away from truth because the fossils represent a time when there was death, and death did not enter into the world until Adam and Eve sinned. And so the whole idea of a pre-creation or a pre-chaos of some kind is, is uh, totally impossible. It is absolutely impossible. That could never have happened. Uh, in fact, they, 
they uh, gild the lily, so to speak, by also saying the world at that time was occupied by angels. Well, angels are spirit beings. They don't have bodies. They don't occupy the earth like humans do. The whole business is ridiculous. So when the Bible in the Old Testament speaks about giants, uh, I know there's several verses that say there's, there were giants in parts of the well, country. Well, now we're referring to Genesis chapter 6. And the word, the Hebrew word that is used there for giant is Nephilim. And later on in the Bible, in the days of, uh, of Israel, there were and there was a line of giants who were called Nephilim. And so that is why it's translated that way here in Genesis 6. But after, uh, but actually God describes who these people were. It says there were giants or Nephilim in the earth. And this is Genesis 6 verse 4. In those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. In other words, these Nephilim, using the Hebrew word, were uh, men of renown. They would be equivalent to our uh, uh, anyone who's in the limelight, a, a, a noted scientist or a noted ball player or a stage actress or, or anybody who is very, very notable in the eyes of the human race of that day they were the men of renown and and the focal point of genesis 6 is that that uh, when the sons of god they are the true believers when they began to look at the daughters of men those are the uh, the the uh, unsaved and they saw what nice decent moral people they were and how upstanding and this and that and pretty soon they began to lust after them and began to marry them. This is happening all the time in our day. The Bible speaks of that as a mixed marriage, or the Bible, that's a violation of the command of the New Testament, don't be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. And so the consequence of this being unequally yoked with an unbeliever is that the focus of the family shifted from a uh, focus on God, who is the Great One, to the to the uh, greatness of a fellow man, the giants, those uh, who are of renown. And wickedness multiplied, and that ended up with the destruction of the world of that day. Actually, it's very parallel to what is happening in our day, uh, that we're, we're also moving very rapidly to the total destruction of the world. Now, one more question, Brother Camping, and um, I, I, I'll jump off the air to hear the answer. Um, when was Lucifer, if, uh, now I know in Isaiah 14 <clears throat> and even Ezekiel 28, as I mentioned before, speaks about Lucifer and, and <clears throat> how he was on the mountain of uh, God. But I want to, is there anywhere in the Bible that hints towards when he was uh, kicked out of heaven? And, uh, and I'm going to hang up to hear your call. Thank well, you, Father. Well, yes. A couple of corrections here. First of all, Isaiah 14 does talk about Satan uh, calling him Lucifer. Uh, and But Ezekiel 28 has nothing to do with Satan. That's talking about mankind himself. Uh, but Lucifer uh, uh, rebelled against God shortly after man was created. It was before Adam and Eve bore any children, and, and yet it was some time after Adam and Eve were created. And we, we find the account of the fall of Lucifer uh, simultaneously with the fall of uh, man as, uh, as uh, Eve obeyed uh, Lucifer, and, uh, and uh, both Lucifer was cursed, uh, Satan was cursed, that is, and also was mankind cursed. And because the curse came simultaneously, we know that that would uh, be describing the time when both Satan or Lucifer rebelled and became Satan and mankind rebelled. Now, he was allowed, mysteriously, and we don't understand all of this, but he was allowed to be in heaven until the time of the cross, uh, until Christ went to the cross and gave uh, Satan a death blow, he was allowed to come into heaven. 
but at the time of the cross he was banished from heaven. We read in Revelation chapter 12, in Revelation 12, where it says in verse 9, uh, uh, and the great dragon, that's Lucifer or Satan or the devil, was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out unto the earth, and his angels were cast out with him, that is, all the angels that rebelled with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. And so that identifies with the timing of the cross. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes. Brother Candy? Yes. Yeah, I want to know, can you give me an example of where a church doctrine is, is not parallel with the Word of God? Where a church doctrine does not follow the Word of God? Yes. Well, the, uh, we already have talked, for example, about uh, the doctrine of the marriage relationship. The Bible says, What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And yet every denomination allows divorce for fornication. So they have set up their own doctrine. They have looked at verses that they can fudge on a little bit and, uh, and convince themselves that this allows them to teach that kind of a wrong doctrine. When it comes to the doctrine of salvation, the Bible insists it is not of works, but it is altogether of grace. And the Bible itself indicates that faith is a work. And yet churches will say, uh, no, God first has to give us faith, and then that will be the instrument through which God works to save us. And so they include some of our work into our salvation or they may even say we have to reach out and accept Christ which again is a work of our on our part or they may say you have to be baptized in water and that's another work that we do but that this is required to initiate or cause salvation and uh, and uh, so on uh, uh, many churches allow women to be in the pulpit uh, that's a violation of the word of God uh, many, uh, most churches no longer speak about hell and damnation. And yet the Bible warns that if they don't do that, their gospel is, uh, is, is worthless. It, and so, again, uh, there are a uh, gr- uh, high percentage of the churches that, that, that uh, are faulted on that score. And, and I could go on. There are other doctrines, but... There, are, uh, there, there, there really are a great many that are contra- that they hold that are contrary to the Word of God. So that was when Christ died two thousand years ago on the cross, He more to die for our sins, but has nothing to do about being saved. Then, is that correct? Oh well, the fact that Christ, uh, 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 in order to save anyone, there are three things that has to happen, and the church. The churches don't understand this at all very well. First of all, we have to be chosen by God. That choice was made before the foundations of the world. The Bible speaks of those who were chosen as those who were elected to salvation. Then, secondly, in order for, for them to become saved, it meant their sins had to be paid for, and only Christ could pay for their sins, so all of the sins of these individuals that were chosen had to be put upon Christ when he went to the cross, and so he was guilty, guilty, guilty before God, and the only way he could remove those sins is by making the payment. And that's what the cross is all about. He had to endure the wrath of God on behalf of these individuals, uh, and that uh, that wrath had to be equivalent to these individuals that were chosen of God spending an eternity in hell. So it was an enormous punishment that Christ endured. 
Then the third thing that has to happen before these individuals can actually become saved is that sometime as they're listening to the Word of God, either as a baby or as an adult or sometime in their life chosen by God, He chooses the time for this, uh, God will apply that word to the ind- to the heart of that individual, and they will become a new creature in Christ. Uh, it's a mighty miracle that has to happen. Now, all three of these things have got to happen, otherwise we we are not saved, and that's why it requires totally the action of God. There's no way that any human can can uh, decide if he that he uh, had to be chosen or not we weren't even in existence at that time there's no one that uh, that uh, could put our sins on Christ Christ had to take our sins and there's no one that can cause himself to become a new creature in Christ I'll be right back with you right after this message we're continuing with the open forum program. We have a caller on the line. We were talking about what is salvation, and as I've already indicated, it is vastly misunderstood by theologians and Bible teachers, uh, and uh, and so they've really developed a salvation where, yes, God did certain things, but we uh, we just have to complete the uh, complete the action, and then we do become saved. Most of the ministers, like I say, I'll say on TV, I won't you know, mention any names, but they ask, like, you know, to accept Christ into your life, and you make that prayer with them. And if you accept Jesus and he lives in your heart, then you're automatically saved, correct? Yeah, but you see, the problem is, is that we are spiritually dead. We are a corpse, spiritually, and there's no one that can reach out to become saved. There, in fact, the Bible says in Romans 3, there's none that seeketh after him and and if if god left me or anyone else to ourselves we would never never become saved we like our sin too much we we are we're spiritually blind we're like uh, god uses the example of lazarus in uh, john 11 he was physically dead a stinking corpse and jesus stood outside that tomb and said lazarus come forth He's been giving that corpse a command. And could Lazarus obey? The answer, of course not. He could not obey. He was a corpse. He was a stinking corpse. But he did obey. So how do you explain that? Well, it's because Christ had to not only command him to obey, but also make him physically alive so that he could obey. And that's a dramatic picture of what salvation is. God commands us to believe God commands us to repent God commands us to seek him and so on and those that he wishes to save at the same time that he commands us he also gives us spiritual life so and as a consequence we're able to obey we begin to believe on him a few more questions and I'll let you go there was a, a man a gentleman on the air that would become a pastor and I'm not mistaken he you told him that you cannot pastor any church a day longer. And you were saying like on Sunday everybody should read the Bible, well, fellowship with other Christians? You see, that's the problem. God I mean, has, uh, has laid out in the Bible His divine economy. For the first 9,500 years of the earth's existence, He worked through individuals. He did not have a, an institution that He worked through. Then, uh, about 1,500 years before Christ came, he formed the nation of Israel. Uh, And when they came out of Egypt as a nation, and he gave them all kinds of laws and gave them spiritual leadership through the priests and through the prophets, and, and, uh, and for 1,500 years approximately, he had them as the representative of the kingdom of God here on this earth. Then at the time that Christ went back to heaven, God was finished with that institution. And he introduced another institution, which he very carefully formed, and he gave a lot of rules in the Bible for it, and that was the New Testament church age. He he explained how to select elders and deacons and the qualifications for them and, and, and instruction for them and so on. 
Uh, and that was the means by which God planned to evangelize the world throughout the Pentecostal church age. But then finally there came a time when that age was finished uh, and the, we have the final season uh, that God has laid out whereby he is reaching the world through individuals, not through churches and congregations. He's not using an institution any longer. He's, he's back where he was uh, 3,500 years ago uh, and using individuals and and uh, that's the way God is finishing the task of evangelizing the world. And uh, we just have to fall into God's plan. When, and that means that there's no point in trying to become a minister in a denomination any longer or a church any longer because God is not using churches anymore to evangelize. But that does not mean that he doesn't have preachers. Every true believer is a preacher of the gospel. The word preach means to proclaim or to publish the gospel, and that is a task God has assigned to every true believer. So, but how do you know that when you're reading the Bible that you're interpreting the scriptures correctly? Well, we do that by very carefully reading and reading and, and praying for wisdom and comparing scripture with scripture. One of the advantages that, or one of the delightful experiences of my life is to be the host of the open forum so that if someone finds a verse or verses that contradict something I teach, they can call up and write out in the marketplace with everybody to listening, they can say, Brother Camping, doesn't this verse teach something different? And if they, if they, uh, if it does teach differently, uh, then I'm delighted to be corrected because I only want to be faithful to the Word of God. But uh, they have to make correction from the Word of God. And, and uh, uh, on the other hand, what I'm finding is, is that as we teach this more and more that the church age has ended, uh, people are calling up with more and more scripture that indicate, yes, that is the case. And no one has been able to come up with scripture that contradicts that in any way. Like, uh, well, I'll let you go. I was on, I've been on disability since 85, and I took care of, of a terminally ill mother with cancer. I also took care of a aunt, and before I went to disability, my father. But in the meantime, I've developed these other towns, and it, it geared me into law. I have never been taught law at all. And I've been to various courts and had good results of obtaining things. Wouldn't you say that's a gift of God? Yeah. Given I, a particular talent? I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your whole... What is your question again? Well, the question I had, I had terminal mother with cancer. I had an aunt that also took care of and my father. Yes. So like the Bible says, honor your mother and thy father, correct? Yes. Okay. But in the meantime, I've been on disability for since 85. Yes. Okay, until now. So in the meantime, I had a lot of legal affairs I had to go through on various entitlements. And I was able to use the statutes and, you know, law libraries and everything. I was never taught law, but I was able to use it. Isn't that a gift of God? Does well, God give I, special talent? I'm sorry. I'm not qualified to solve all your problem. All I know is, as, well, I, now, as I understand your question, I uh, just make sure that whatever your conduct is, is faithful to the Word of God. Seek Christ first in His righteousness. And if you're unsure about a particular action, pray the Lord for wisdom. Pray the Lord for wisdom. And and uh, it, whenever I find problems that I can't solve, I start uh, reading the Bible more carefully and, and again and again and praying for wisdom. And again and again I find that somewhere along the line I begin to have a little bit more insight as to what I should do concerning this problem. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Mr. Camping, how are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a, a quick question. It's a loaded question, though. Uh, is it possible at all for someone who's in a false gospel, who's very deep in a false gospel, to uh, become saved, to, to, become, uh, to get out of that? Or are they all absolutely uh, marked for damnation? Oh, I, I wouldn't dare make that assertion that they're marked for damnation. Uh, the, 
the, we're living in the day of, of uh, salvation. If I had a loved one, for example, that was deep in a wrong gospel, I, I would be praying for that individual all the time. Oh, Lord, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. And God can, and that person is living very wickedly because they're in a wrong kind of a gospel altogether, but Christ came for sinners. And we can't, we can't shortchange God as to who he will save. We know he won't become saved uh, in that church. God is not saving people in churches anymore. But it may be that uh, someplace outside of that church he hears the gospel from a source that has nothing to do with the church, and God can still save him. Should I be the one to uh, to, to contradict um, the the things, the doctrines that that, that my loved one believes, um, seeing you know as how it would create all kinds of friction? Well, and... the 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 fact is, anybody who is not saved. Has, is living by principles and ideas and doctrines that are that are wrong. Otherwise, they wouldn't they wouldn't be be out there. And we approach anyone who's not saved the same way with the gospel. We're all sinners, and we need the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And so, just try to present to Him like you would anybody else. The, the whole counsel of God that we're sinners under the wrath of God and only in Christ is their salvation and and uh, but God has to <coughs> do the saving try at least to get that individual to spend more time reading the Bible because it is through the Word of God that God does save see um, it's just we have I have, an, I have a loved one who's um, who knows the basics of the gospel and how Jesus Christ came for sinners and and yeah. all of that and uh, but there, there's also the there's also attached to it the belief in um, additional revelation and and you know, yes. being slain in the spirit which just spooks me. Well, that's that's because they uh, are in a, in a wrong gospel and they don't realize that every gospel is structured and determined by its divine authority. The true gospel is structured and determined by the Bible alone and in its entirety. The moment that we believe that there is additional revelation then uh, from God in addition to the Bible, then our authority is widened because the authority then becomes the Bible plus what we think we are hearing in a dream or a vision or from some other source. And then it's going, we're going to have a different kind of a gospel. And so the you might, uh, for example, we have a little booklet in Family Radio uh, that uh, identifies with tongues, or, or we have another booklet, What is the True Gospel? And you might uh, send for that, and uh, that might be a little help to you as you, that you can sh uh, share a copy with them. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, Brother Camping? Yes. Oh, here, let me turn my radio down. Uh, yes. Praise God, Brother Camping, for you and your uh, station. You know, I have a couple of really quick questions. I'll go very quickly because I know that our time is valuable here left on the planet. Um, I, I wanted to ask you first, uh, where does the Word tell us, Brother Camping, uh, that we have uh, 120 years to live or 70 to 80 years to live? Well, the 120 years is in... Genesis chapter 6 around verse 3 or verse 4 and that is cannot be talking about the lifespan of ordinary human humans because at the time the lifespan of Noah uh, was 950 years and of Seth his son was 600 years and but that 120 years was probably the time that uh, from when God told Noah to start building the ark and uh, uh, up until the time that he destroyed the world with the flood of that day. On the other hand, uh, this uh, Moses, uh, many, many, many years later, about 3,500 years ago, uh, uh, wrote uh, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in, uh, I believe, around Psalm 90, if I remember, that the... Uh, that uh, the expectation of our life is 70 years, or if by reason of strength, 80 years. Now, I don't know uh, 
Uh, oh, here it is in uh, Psalm 90, verse 10. The days of our years are three score years and ten. Now, a score is 20 years, so three score would be 60 years, and 10 would make 70 years. So the days of our years are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, four times 20 would be 80 years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. It's very significant that under the best circumstances, as we have in the United States today, where we have very good health, uh, uh, practices and so on. Uh, the expectation of a baby that's just born is about uh, 75 to 80 years. That's uh, that's the average lifespan. That's still the expected age. And and so under the best conditions, that has not really changed. So interesting that it has changed from uh, back in the day of Adam and Noah and Methuselah that were uh, into their 900s that now uh, God has found us to be so natural or, or with our own natures to, to kind of limit ourselves. And how old are you, Brother Camping? I'm 81. Okay, praise, praise the Lord. Now, well, you, see, my next... you see, what happened was that mankind was created as a perfect being. There was no sin in the world to begin with. And only after sin came did God bring a judgment or a curse upon the world. And then slowly on viruses and bad, bad bacteria and, and so on began to develop. But it took a long, long time before it became an integral, the, the results of all this became an integral part in the bones and in the structure of mankind. So that for the first 6,000 years, uh, uh, the lifespans were consistently uh, around uh, 900 years. The youngest one that we learn of before the flood of Noah's day was Noah's father. He died at the age of 777 years. And then Noah was the last of these very long-lived persons. He lived to be 950 years. Then his son Seth was 600 years. And then over the next couple of thousand years, the lifespan shortened and shortened until Terah, the father of Abraham, was 215 years. Abraham died at the age of 175. And then we finally get to uh, Joseph. Uh, he lived to be 110. And then, uh, then we get to Moses. Now Moses uh, and Aaron, his brother, they uh, they did not uh, they did not. Uh, uh, they were unusual in that Moses lived to be 120 and his brother Aaron 123. But at that time, God pegged the lifespan at 70 or 80 years because if he had not done that, mankind eventually would have annihilated himself. That is, the, the ravages of, of sin and the viruses and the defects, the birth defects would have continued to multiply and slowly on the lifespan would get shorter and shorter and shorter and in fact there have been times in history when the average life expectancy and it's still true in some countries today in Africa where the AIDS is uh, is uh, very very dominant in some areas and and the uh, cleanliness is very poor the life expectancy may only be 40 years or 45 years but even on but but God still made it possible for mankind uh, to live as long as 70 or 80 years, and that's, that, that became the, the, uh, the average expectancy under good conditions, and uh, God uh, made sure that, that uh, the uh, defects and the uh, viruses and the poisons and everything else that are in the world would not take out men earlier than that uh, or consistently all over the world. That's a very good point that you make, too, about the other countries, that uh, uh, it should humble our country uh, to know that, uh, you know, those countries have practiced other things in their in their generations that uh, have they have found themselves where they are today, and yeah. that America, in its short time, uh, yeah. Initially, when we first uh, adopted the, the scriptures and the Ten Commandments, etc., and the Supreme yeah. Court and in school, uh, and when, now we're removing all those things, and, the, and we're wondering why we're having all these challenges. But um, my other quick question is really fast, uh, uh, Brother Camping, and I'm very uh, lucky to uh, speak with you. Um, 
you mentioned wisely uh, from the scriptures that women are, cannot teach us, uh, or, or, you know, you, I mean, I don't want to just uh, put a blanket statement over that, but uh, I understand that women are, in the scriptures, uh, there's a new place, uh, a, great, a great place for women. Women were the first people that Jesus reappeared to when he rose and saved all of us, whether we are elect or not. Um, but uh, if a woman stands in an assembly or I see so much on the TV that, uh, uh, you know, women read the, you know, they mostly preach their own things. But can't a woman uh, read us the Bible and, and aren't we going to be uh, educated by that? And I've at least even heard well, on family you see, radio. But that's, we don't establish the rules. God establishes the rules. And in the assembly, when... When a woman stands and reads the Bible and there are men present, yes, she is teaching. She is teaching. And uh, it, now, if it's a Bible class, there's no reason why she can't ask a question or make a comment. But the moment she begins to take over the role as a teacher, then, then she is in violation of the Word of God if men are present. Now, if only women are present and children, yes, she can teach. And certainly, she is a prophet. Uh, she uh, she is uh, mandated and qualified to, to be a witness of the Word of God. She can witness to her neighbor. She can stand on the corner and pass out tracts to individuals. But uh, she can do all of those things. But, but insofar as uh, uh, the Bible simply says, I permit no woman to teach or have authority over men. And so we have to take that for what it says. Now, on the other side of the coin, in exactly the same chapter, same passage, God says, but women have a role that no man can have, and that is she can bear children. And that's the glorious and wonderful prerogative of women. And no man can, can have that privilege at all. And so there is a balancing you see there. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hello? Hello. Yeah, Mr. Campin, yeah. I have uh, two questions for you, okay? Yes. Um, can you uh, read Matthew 24, verse 7, please? Verse 7? Yes. Matthew 24, verse 7. Matthew 24, verse 7. Let's look at that. Matthew 24, verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, what is your question? Okay. Uh, my question to you is regarding the um, end of the church age. What is um, the earthquake? What does that mean spiritually? And the uh, pestilences, you know, the diseases? What does that mean? I mean, what does that have to do with the end of the church age? Because I've heard you taught that um, this chapter has everything to do with the end of the church age. Well, the, this is simply a, a negation. That is, he God is saying, now don't look at uh, at the uh, at the uh, natural disasters in the world, like earthquakes and volcanoes and pestilences as an indicator as to how close to the end we are. That's not where you are to look. Uh, he turns around right along uh, uh, in, 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 in verse 11 or verse 10, and he says, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. Now we're getting back into the indicators that there is a falling away from truth in the churches and congregations. But we don't find the indicator by seeing how much activity there is uh, insofar as earthquakes are concerned or famines or, or uh, natural disasters of that kind. Okay, could, uh, could it be that um, the earthquake and the pestilences, could it be that those have a spiritual um, meaning that we just don't know yet? Well, uh, uh, it, it's possible that they might have some spiritual meaning. I don't readily see that in its context. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, these are constant. These things that we're reading about in verse 7 are constant all through the, uh, the uh, New Testament church age. 
and they are the beginning of sorrows that is uh, they do bring sufferings and sorrows now there may be a, sp a spiritual meaning uh, but uh, I don't know uh, 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 we could we could uh, uh, bring a spiritual meaning to this that in the churches for example God is uh, is uh, there are those who are rebelling against the the, the kingdom of God as God has set it and they want their own kind of a kingdom so that so that uh, there is a rebellion against God uh, and uh, famines and pestilences now you know I, I have a hard time with that I have a real hard time with that and I I, I, I don't feel qualified to see this any spiritual meaning in this uh, even though that, that might exist but at this point in time I don't feel qualified to know about it Okay, my second question to you is, um, the Bible says that uh, we should not make any image of um, anything, yes. both on earth and in heaven, right? And bow down yeah. and worship it. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have a figurine of a cow, or a figurine of a dolphin, or a figurine of a man. Uh, we can have that. But if we, if we make anything... And, and say that is our God. Like, for example, uh, Israel, they made a, 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 an image of a calf, and then they bowed down and worshipped it. And that was a dreadful sin on their part. So why did God tell them to have the Ark of the Covenant? What, I mean, why did God, you know, raise up the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament? Well, that, you know, that ark was never seen by anybody, even when the high priest went in once a year. Uh, all the other priests were driven out of the temple, and so no one could look in there when the curtain was open, and the high priest just sprinkled blood on the mercy seat. And even then, first there was incense, which was a cloud that that obscured the, uh, the uh, two cherubim that were... Uh, on the lid, uh, above the lid, or the mercy seat of the ark. And so uh, uh, that God did design that as a representation of Christ. Uh, and But, but the, God, God made his own uh, exception, and he put this in a place where nobody could, could witness it. Uh, it's, uh, it. It was a very, very special situation. Okay, you, um, I just want to say that um, I've been listening to uh, Family Radio for um, two or three years now, and I've been uh, very, very blessed by your ministry. And um, I just pray that God continue to bless you and continue to bless your ministry. Thank you so much for calling and sharing. Now we have come to the end of our time. I'm sorry we can't take any more callers. Uh, let me encourage all of us, again, to read the Bible. Read the Bible. And if you're having difficulty in some area of your life, uh, go to the Lord. Listen. To, let Him speak to you. And He speaks to you as you carefully read the Bible. And you can speak to Him as you pray for wisdom, pray for understanding and obedience. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.